Canals, Part 2, Canals in America Table of Contents, Canals Part 2, Canals in America All about canals in the U.S. and Canada. This includes improvements in the Erie Canal and canals in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and Illinois. Dr. Sidney Socloff. Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com. 2023. Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Coltov. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one/ytnavigator. The great success of the Erie Canal inspired the building of many other canals in America. These are major canals built in the U.S. in the 19th century. This is a chronological list of the most significant canals in the U.S. used by settlers. During the initial settlement period, the Great Lakes and its rivers were the only practical means of moving people and freight. Barges from Middle North America reached the Atlantic Ocean from the Great Lakes when the Erie Canal opened in 1825. These are the U.S. and Canadian canals to the Great Lakes. This is the population density in the U.S. in 1790. Almost all of the population was concentrated near the eastern seaboard bordering the Atlantic Ocean. These are travel times in the early 1800s. Before canals and railroads. Travel times were very long. These are colonial roads and trails. Note that almost all of these were east of the Appalachian Mountains. Before the canals and railroads. Travel times were very long. These are travel times in 1830. Completing the Erie Canal and other canals in the east significantly decreased the travel time to the Great Lakes region. These are travel times in 1857. The railroad significantly decreased the travel times east of the Mississippi River. This is the population growth of the U.S. from 1830 to 1920, showing an increase of 15 million in 1830 to 105 million in 1920. Much of this growth was made possible by the canals and later by the extensive railroad network. This shows the population density of the U.S. in 1820, 1840, and 1860. The rapid expansion westward was due mainly to the canals and later to the extensive railroad network. This is the population density of the U.S. in 1820. This is the United States in 1840. This is the population density of the U.S. in 1840. This is the population density of the U.S. in 1860. The Erie Canal today. The New York State Barge Canal was completed in 1918 for $101 million. Freight traffic reached a total of 5.2 million tons by 1951 before declining in the face of combined rail and truck competition. Today, it is part of the New York State Canal System mainly used by recreational watercraft in the recent past. The canal has seen an upsurge in commercial traffic. The new canal replaced much of the original route, leaving many abandoned sections, most notably between Syracuse and Rome, and sought to canalize rivers along the way that the original canal sought to avoid, such as the Mohawk Seneca in Clyde Rivers and Oneida Lake. In sections that did not consist of canalized rivers, particularly between Rochester and Buffalo, 
The original Erie Canal channel was enlarged 120 feet in width and 12 feet in depth. This expansive undertaking to allow barges of up to 2,000 tons was politically unpopular in some parts of the state not served by the canal and failed to save it from becoming obsolete. Today, the Erie Canal is predominantly a pleasure boat paradise, linking the state and providing a tremendous opportunity for travel and leisure. In 1992, the New York State Barge Canal was renamed the New York State Canal System, including the Erie, Cayuga Seneca, Oswego, and Champlain Canals, and was put under the authority of the newly created New York State Canal Corporation, a subsidiary of the New York State Thruway Authority. Today, the Erie Canal Corridor covers 524 miles 843 kilometers of navigable water from Lake Champlain to the capital region and west to Lake Erie. The area has a population of 2.7 million. And it has been estimated that about 75% of upstate New York's population lives within 25 miles 40 kilometers of the Erie Canal. In 2006, recreational boating usage fees were eliminated in hopes of attracting more visitors to the canal system. The canal system is currently operated using money generated by through way tolls. The modern Erie Canal has 34 locks, which are painted with the blue and gold colors of the New York State Canal System's parent authority, the Thruway Authority. Due to the growth of the highway system, railroads, and the St. Lawrence Seaway, commercial traffic on the canal declined dramatically during the second half of the 20th century. Since the 1990s, the use of the canal system has been primarily by recreational traffic, although a very limited amount of commercial traffic still uses the system. The Erie Canal is open to small craft and some larger vessels for most of the year. During the winter, water is drained from parts of the canal, enabling repairs and maintenance. The annual boating season runs from May through November. A 36-mile, 58 kilometers, stretch of the Old Canal is preserved by the State of New York at the Old Erie Canal State Historic Park. The Old Erie Canal State Historic Park is a part of the New York State Park System. It is a linear park encompassing a 36-mile segment of the original Erie Canal's long level section and extends eastward from east of Syracuse, almost to Rome, New York. This section of the canal was in active use between 1825 and 1917. The Old Erie Canal Sections of the Old Erie Canal abandoned after 1918 are owned by New York State or have been ceded to or purchased by counties or municipalities. Many stretches of the Old Canal have been filled in to create roads, such as Erie Boulevard in Syracuse, Broad Street, and the Rochester Subway in Rochester. The Erie Canal Museum in Syracuse is housed in the Old Waylock Building built in 1850, during the Greek Revival days of upstate New York. It is the only remaining Waylock building of its kind in the world. The park's eastern terminus is at Erie Canal Village, a privately operated museum and historic recreation of a 19th century canal village outside of Rome. The Erie Canal Village is an outdoor living history museum. It is a reconstructed 19th century settlement on the site where, on July 4, 1817, the first shovelful of earth was turned for the construction of the original Erie Canal. 
A horse-drawn packet boat plies a section of the enlarged canal, giving visitors a taste of early 19th century water travel. Typical structures of the 19th century can be viewed such as Bennett's Tavern Blacksmith Shop Railroad Station Ice House Wood Creek School Maynard Methodist Church Shell Victorian House Setchler's House Crosby House and the Canal Store. Some local municipalities have also elected to preserve their sections of the canal as town or county canal parks, or have plans to do so in some communities. The old canal has been cleared of overgrowth and debris and has been refilled with water. This is a commercial to boat locking through Baldwinsville Lock 24. There are many parks and museums along the route of the old Erie Canal. The parks and museums include Erie Canal Village near Rome. Chittenango Landing Canal Boat Museum near Chittenango, Old Deary Canal State Historic Park in DeWitt, Erie Canal Museum in downtown Syracuse, Camillus Erie Canal Park in Camillus, Niagara Escarpment 5 Flight Locks at Lockport, Jordan Canal Park in Jordan, Town of Elbridge, Centerport Aqueduct Park near Weedsport, Lock Berlin Park near Clyde. Old Deary Canal Lock 60 Park in Mesa Dawn. And the Mesa Dawn Aqueduct Park near Palmyra. This is a modern single lock at the Niagara Escarpment. How big were the canal boats? This shows the cross-section of the original Erie Canal and the enlargement of 1862. The original canal was 40 feet wide at the top, 26 feet at the bottom, and only 4 feet deep. This shows the sizes of the Erie Canal boats from 1817 to 1899. Although the first Erie Canal boats of 1817 weighed only 30 tons, they had a capacity of 1,000 bushels of wheat. By 1862, the weight increased to 240 tons with a capacity of 8,000 bushels of wheat. Standard 40-foot containers intended for intercontinental use have external nominal dimensions of 40 feet long by 8 feet wide by 9 feet high. The maximum gross weight is 67,200 pounds or 30,480 kilograms or 33.6 tons. Other Early U.S. Canals These are canals in the U.S. circa 1825. The Canal Building Boom From 1815 to 1834, $58.6 million was spent on canal construction, of which $41.2 million were public funds. From 1834 to 1844 $72.2 million were spent of which $57.3 million were public funds. And from 1844 to 1860 $57.4 million was spent of which $38.0 million were public funds. The problem was that the Erie Canal was the only one that made money. These are the major canals in the U.S. in the 19th century. The Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, C and D Canal, is a 14-mile, 23 kilometers long, 450 foot, 137 meter wide, and 35 foot, 11 meter deep ship canal that cuts across the states of Maryland and Delaware. The Chesapeake and Delaware Canal connects the Delaware River to Chesapeake Bay, the emptying point of the Susquehanna River, and the port of Baltimore.
This canal provides Philadelphia direct access to Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. The work started in 1803 but stopped in 1805 when the funds were exhausted. Construction resumed in 1824 and was completed in 1829. The swampy marshlands along the canal's planned route proved a great impediment to progress as workers continuously battled slides along the soft slopes of the ditch being cut. The nearly $2.5 million cost made it one of the most expensive canal projects of its time. In contrast to the Erie Canal, the Philadelphia business and political leaders were faced with the horrendous task of building a canal across Pennsylvania, which would require 3,358 feet of lockage, and a four-mile-long tunnel to get canal boats to Pittsburgh. Philadelphia was the largest city in colonial America. The Allegheny Mountains, however, were a major barrier to canal building and the major rivers in western Pennsylvania. The Delaware and the Susquehanna ran mostly north to south. The Pennsylvania Canal which connected Philadelphia to the Ohio River at Pittsburgh was completed in 1834. However, by the time New York City with its Erie Canal completed almost 10 years earlier had an unbeatable head start. Throughout our new nation, more than 4,000 miles of towpath canals were dug in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 1,356 miles of canals, more than in any other state, linked together her cities, villages, factories, mines, and farms. Over the mighty Allegheny Mountains went the canal system. The whole journey from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh which involved crossing the Allegheny Mountains, was to be made in canal boats. However, the boats were to travel part of the way on wheels and part on water. This system was completed in the year 1832. Ten years later, Charles Dickens traveled over part of it when crossing the Alleghenies on his way to the west. This is an 1836 Pennsylvania map with the profile of the Pennsylvania Canal. This is the 1836 map showing the profile of the eastern section of the Pennsylvania Canal. Note the rough terrain of the Allegheny Mountain region at the far eastern end just before reaching Philadelphia. A tunnel through the mountains was impractical, so a portage railroad had to be constructed to get the barges between Hollidaysburg and Johnstown. By this time, in 1825, steam locomotive power was successfully used on the Stockton and Darlington Railroad in England. There was a debate about whether or not to build the railway, but the canal supporters won and construction began on July 4, 1826. The Allegheny Portage Railroad was the first railroad constructed through the Allegheny Mountains in central Pennsylvania. The Allegheny Portage Railroad was a series of 10 inclines, approximately 36 miles long, and operated from 1834 to 1854. The Allegheny Portage Railroad connected the two branches of the Pennsylvania Mine Line Canal from Johnstown on the west to Hollidaysburg on the east, thus allowing continuous barge traffic between the Ohio and the Susquehanna rivers. The Allegheny Portage Railroad connected the two branches of the Pennsylvania Mine Line Canal from Johnstown on the west to Hollidaysburg on the east thus allowing continuous barge traffic between the Ohio and the Susquehanna rivers. The Allegheny Portage Railroad included the first railroad tunnel in the U.S., the Staple Bend Tunnel. Its inauguration was marked with great fanfare. 
Construction of the Allegheny Portage Railroad began in 1831 and took three years to complete. The state of Pennsylvania financed the project to compete with the Erie Canal in New York, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in Maryland. The work was mainly done through private contractors. The railroad used ten inclined planes, five on either side of the summit of the Allegheny Ridge. The vertical ascent from Johnstown was 1,172 feet, 355 meters. The vertical ascent from Hollidaysburg was 1,399 feet, 424 meters. The barges were drawn by horses along level sections, which included a 900-foot, 273-meter, tunnel, as well as a viaduct over the Little Conema River upstream from Johnstown. A typical voyage took between six and seven hours to complete. The entire mainline system connecting Pittsburgh and Philadelphia was 400 miles, 640 kilometers, long. The illustration shows a sectional canal boat being hauled out of one of the inclined planes of the Portage Railroad. Traction was using a stationary engine and endless cable. The Portage Railroad was 36 and one half miles long, with a total rise and fall of 2,570 feet. Linking the eastern and western sections of Pennsylvania's main line of public works, the Allegheny Portage Railroad carried a combination of canal boats and rail cars across the summit of the Allegheny Mountains. The boats were built in sections for convenience and handling and to make their movement over land practicable. Passengers and goods were picked up in Philadelphia on half a canal boat mounted on wheeled trolleys. The other half of the boat followed behind. Motive buoy through the streets was supplied by horses or mules. Arriving at the railway terminus, the boat sections were transferred to special trucks drawn over the rails at first by horses and later by locomotives. At Johnstown, which lies on the other side of the mountains, the boats were once more assembled and returned to their proper element, completing the journey on a canal linking Johnstown to Pittsburgh. The journey from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, a distance of about 400 miles, was covered from four days to a week. At either end of the line from Philadelphia to Columbia, known from the first as the Pennsylvania Railroad, there was an inclined plane and a stationary engine of 60 horsepower for haulage purposes. In 1854, the Portage Railroad was rendered obsolete by the construction of a locomotive railroad over the Alleghenies by the Pennsylvania Railroad, a private company. Today, the remains of the railroad are preserved within the Allegheny Portage Railroad National Historic Site a United States National Historic Site that is operated by the National Park Service. The historic site was established in 1964 and is approximately 12 miles, 19 kilometers, west of Altoona. In his American Notes, Charles Dickens gives an amusing account of his journey from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh by this system. He describes the canal boat as a barge with the little house in it viewed from the outside, and a caravan at the fair, viewed from within. Unlike the Erie Canal, the Pennsylvania Canal was a huge financial disaster. The main line cost about $33 million to build with interest costs of $43.5 million, for a total of $76.5 million. Revenue was only $8 million, and the entire system was eventually sold for $11 million, 
making the total loss to Pennsylvania taxpayers $57.5 million. Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Baltimore was also a major city and port in colonial America. Again, here, as in the case of Boston and Philadelphia, the mountains were a major barrier to canal building. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was started in 1828 from a point near Washington, D.C., and was initially intended to reach the Ohio River at Pittsburgh. The canal was completed in 1850, but went only 185 miles to Cumberland, Maryland. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was soon superseded by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which eventually went over the mountains to reach the Ohio River at Wheeling, Virginia, now West Virginia, in 1853. Although this gave Baltimore a big boost of support, it was too late to compete with New York City. The Allegheny Mountain Range is part of the Appalachian Mountain Range of the eastern United States and Canada. It is a northeast-southwest orientation and runs for over 500 miles 800 kilometers, from north-central Pennsylvania through western Maryland and eastern West Virginia to southwestern Virginia. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, abbreviated as the Sea and Low Canal, and occasionally referred to as the Grand Old Ditch, operated from 1836 until 1924 parallel to the Potomac River in Maryland from Cumberland, Maryland, to Washington, D.C. The total length of the Sea and O Canal is about 185 miles, 300 kilometers. The elevation change of 605 feet, 185 meters, was accommodated with 74 canal locks to enable the canal to cross relatively small streams. Over 150 culverts were built. The crossing of major streams required the construction of 11 aqueducts, 10 of which remain. The canal goes through the 3,120 feet. 950 meters, Pawpaw Tunnel. Though surpassed by many tunnels today, the Pawpaw Tunnel remains one of the world's longest canal tunnels and was one of the most remarkable engineering feats of its day. The principal cargo on the canal was coal from the Allegheny Mountains. The canal way is now maintained as a park, with a trail following the old tow path the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal National Historical Park. George Washington played a large part in its creation. Washington founded the Potomac Company in 1785 to make improvements to the Potomac River to improve its navigability. The Potomac Company built several skirting canals around the major falls including the Potomac Canal in Virginia. The completion of the Erie Canal worried southern traders that the northern canal might threaten their business. Plans for a canal linking the Chesapeake Bay and Ohio River we made as early as 1820, in 1824. The holdings of the Potomac Company we ceded to the Chesapeake and Ohio Company. When completed, the Sea and O Canal allowed boats and rafts to flow downstream towards Georgetown. Going upstream was a bit harder. Slim boats could be slowly pulled up river. Benjamin Wright, formerly chief engineer of the Erie Canal, was named chief engineer of this new effort and construction began with a groundbreaking ceremony on July 4, 1828 by President John Quincy Adams. Baltimore was also a major city and port in colonial America. Again, here, as in the case of Boston and Philadelphia, 
The mountains were a major barrier to canal building. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was started in 1828 from a point near Washington, D.C., and was initially intended to reach the Ohio River at Pittsburgh. The canal was completed in 1850 but went only 185 miles to Cumberland, Maryland. This is the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. This is the Monocacy Aqueduct on the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was soon superseded by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which eventually went over the mountains to reach the Ohio River at Wheeling, Virginia, now West Virginia, in 1853. Although this gave Baltimore a big boost as a port, it was too late to compete with New York City. In 1843, the Potomac Aqueduct Bridge was constructed near the present-day Key Bridge to connect the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal to the Alexandria Canal, which led to Alexandria, Virginia. The abandoned canal was purchased in 1938 by the United States government, which planned to restore it as a recreation area and develop the canal and towpath as a parkway. However, some opposed the idea of turning the canal over to automobiles, including United States Supreme Court Associate Justice William O. Douglas. The tide was turned against the parkway idea, and in 1971, the canal was designated a National Historical Park. Presently, the park includes nearly 20,000 acres, 80 square kilometers, and receives over 3 million recorded visits each year. Flooding continues to threaten historic structures on the canal and attempts at restoration. The Park Service has rewatered portions of the canal, but most of the canal does not have water. These are Civilian Conservation Corps workers restoring the canal in 1939. This is a canal boat on the Sea and O Canal near Great Falls. This is a view of the Sea and O Canal from behind the Georgetown shops in Washington, D.C. The canals in Ohio. After achieving statehood in 1803, Ohio was a sparsely populated state of 50,000 persons scattered and with no economic means of transportation of goods. With no market access, agriculture served only local needs, and manufacturing was nearly non-existent. As early as 1787, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson had discussed the desirability of a canal, linking Lake Erie to the Ohio River as part of a national system of canals. These are the canals in Ohio in the period of 1825 to 1913. The Ohio and Erie Canal was constructed in the early 1800s and connected the Ohio River at Portsmouth to Lake Erie at Cleveland, Ohio. The main trunk of the canal was 308 miles long and contained 146 locks. Five feeder canals added 25 miles and six additional locks to the system. The canal carried freight traffic from 1827 to 1861, and then freight traffic rapidly diminished due to the construction of railroads. From 1862 to 1913, the canal was a water source for industries and towns in 1913. The canal was abandoned after much of it was destroyed by a flood. On July 3, 1827, the first canal boat on the Ohio and Erie Canal left Akron, traveled through 41 locks and over three aqueducts along 37 miles of canal to arrive at Cleveland on July 4. While the average speed of 3 miles per hour seems slow, 
Canal boats could carry 10 tons of goods and were much more efficient than wagons over rutted trails. This graph shows the annual expenditures and revenues accrued by the Ohio and Erie Canal to the state of Ohio. The canal enjoyed a golden period of prosperity from the 1830s to the early 1860s. However, immediately following the Civil War, it became apparent that railroads would take the canal's business. On March 23rd, 1913, Ohio's canal system ended abruptly. After a winter of record snowfall, storms dumped abnormally heavy rain on the state, causing extensive flooding. This caused the reservoirs to spill into the canals, destroying aqueducts, washing out banks, and devastating most of the locks. The Ohio and Erie Canal's remaining watered section is in Summit County. To this day, the Ohio and Erie Canal is maintained as a water supply for local industries. A section of the Ohio and Erie Canal in Cuyahoga County was transferred to the National Park Service in 1989 as part of the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreational Area, now known as the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. The Miami and Erie Canal In 1825, construction of the Miami Canal was started from Cincinnati to Dayton in the 1830s. It was decided to extend the canal to Lake Erie at Toledo, and the canal was renamed the Miami and Erie Canal in 1845. The Miami and Erie Canal was completed from the Ohio River to Lake Erie. The Miami and Erie Canal The Miami and Erie Canal had 19 aqueducts, 3 guard locks, and 103 canal locks. Each lock measured 90 feet by 15 feet, and they raised the canal 395 feet above Lake Erie and 513 feet above the Ohio River. The Miami and Erie Canal consisted of 301 miles of canal channel and was completed for $8 million in 1845. Boats were towed at about 4 to 5 miles per hour along the canal, using either donkeys or horses. Completed just before most of the railroads in Ohio were built, the canal competed with railroads through much of its useful life. Ice in the winter and the slowness of the boats made it reasonably impractical compared to railroads. And by 1906, the canal had largely ceased to operate. The Pennsylvania and Ohio Canal Work began on the Pennsylvania and Ohio Canal, or P&O Canal as it was commonly called in 1835 to connect the Ohio River with the Ohio and Erie Canal. Large celebrations occurred along the canal's route when it officially opened on August 4, 1840. Workers dug the 82 miles of the P&O using picks, shovels, and wheelbarrows. It ran from Newcastle, Pennsylvania, to Akron, Ohio along old Native American trails and the Cuyahoga and Nahoning rivers. Mules and horses pulled the canal boats that navigated the P&O, using this and other canals. Goods and passengers were ferried from Pittsburgh to Cleveland and Lake Erie. All sections of the canal were shut down by 1872. The Western Canals other than the Erie Canal, the Eastern Canals had little long-run impact on the economy. What did have a big impact on the economy were the canals built in the West from 1845 to 1860. These canals, built in Ohio, Indiana and Illinois, diverted freight traffic out of the North-South River system and into the Great Lakes. 
the Great Lakes had been navigable by a series of canals connecting them. The most important was the Welland Canal from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie, bypassing Niagara Falls, built in 1833. A very short but important canal is the Louisville and Portland Canal. It was a 2-mile, 3.2 kilometers, canal bypassing the falls of the Ohio River at Louisville, Kentucky. The falls of the Ohio River form the only barrier to navigation between the origin of the Ohio at Pittsburgh and the port of New Orleans on the Gulf of Mexico. Circumventing the falls of the Ohio was long a goal for Pennsylvania and Cincinnati merchants. The Ohio River flows from Pittsburgh to the Mississippi River near Cairo, Illinois. It is free-flowing except for a two-mile stretch near Louisville, where it makes a 22-foot drop over a limestone ledge. There were three chutes through the rapids at the falls of the Ohio. The riverbed falls 26 feet in, 3 miles at the falls of the Ohio in addition to falls. There are three rapids called chutes. The Louisville and Portland Canal opened in 1830 as the private Louisville and Portland Canal Company, but was gradually bought out during the 19th century by the federal government. The Wabash and Erie Canal The Wabash and Erie Canal was a shipping canal that linked the Great Lakes to the Ohio River via an artificial waterway. The canal provided traders access from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. Over 460 miles long, it was the longest canal ever built in North America. This shows the entire 460-mile route of the Wabash and Erie Canal from Lake Erie near Toledo to Evansville, Indiana on the Ohio River. Construction began in 1832 and reached Evansville on the Ohio River in 1853. It only operated for about a decade before it became apparent that the canal was not economically viable. Even when canal boats were operated at extremely slow speeds, the banks rapidly eroded, and the canal had to be constantly dredged to be operable. Operation of the canal ended after only 21 years in 1874. Transportation on the Great Lakes The Illinois and Michigan Canal By 1848, with the Illinois and Michigan Canal opening at Chicago, direct access to the Mississippi River was possible from the lakes. These two canals provided an all-inland water route between New York City and New Orleans. The Illinois and Michigan Canal ran 96 miles, 155 kilometers from Chicago on the Chicago River to LaSalle, Illinois, on the Illinois River. It was finished in 1848 and allowed boat transportation from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. The canal enabled navigation across the Chicago Portage and helped establish Chicago as the transportation hub of the United States, opening before railroads were laid in the area. It ceased transportation operations in 1933. The St. Lawrence Seaway The St. Lawrence Seaway is the common name for a system of canals that permits ocean-going vessels to travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, as far as Lake Superior. This is the St. Lawrence Seaway. And the Great Lakes Waterway. In 2002, 162 million net tons of dry bulk cargo were moved on the lakes. This was in order of volume iron ore, grain, and potash. Iron ore and much of the stone and coal are used in the steel industry. 
the extensive system of canals and locks, known as the St. Lawrence Seaway, was officially opened in 1959 by Queen Elizabeth II, representing Canada, and President Dwight D. Eisenhower. The seaway now permits ocean-going vessels to pass all the way to Lake Superior. The St. Lawrence Seaway, an introduction. We will next have a movie about the St. Lawrence Seaway. When Nelson roamed the seven seas, he never guessed that one day there would be an eighth. A pity that Britain's greatest sailor never sailed into the heart of the oldest dominion. But Nelson was before his time, because it was only in June 1959 that the Queen and President Eisenhower officially opened the Great St. Lawrence Seaway, and ships from the oceans of the world could sail 2,000 miles into the heart of North America. Suddenly, Canada had a south coast, and the United States a north coast. At last, it was possible to load grain in Duluth and sail it to London, or load textiles in Liverpool and unload them in Chicago. Men had been dreaming of this for 300 years. It was in 1563 that Jack Cartier sailed nearly a thousand miles up the St. Lawrence River until he was stopped by rapids. At this place, a hundred years later, a handful of French colonists founded Montreal. Here is Canada's greatest city and port, a thousand miles from the sea. Here is the start of the most exciting, ambitious, and controversial project the world has ever known, the St. Lawrence Seaway. Twenty-two thousand men worked on it for four years. They and their machines dug out 51 million cubic yards of rock and soil. They dredged 18 million cubic yards of channels. They poured 2 million cubic yards of concrete using 10 million bags of cement. And the cost? Over a billion dollars. Sometimes, in spite of the ingenuity of the engineers and the planners, the seaway just couldn't dodge a town. Iroquois was one place that was due for flooding. So they moved everything that was worth moving and built a new town a mile away. In Iroquois, if you said you were moving house, boy, you meant it. It took 20 years to build the Panama Canal. The St. Lawrence Seaway was finished in four. Let's take a trip up the new seaway from Montreal to Niagara. First stage takes us up to Lake St. Louis. The Jacques Cartier Bridge was 60 feet too low for seaway traffic. So they jacked up the spans near the middle into an elegant curve and put in a new center section. The first lock is the St. Lambert, where the seaway passes under one of the busiest rail and road bridges in the country. To raise this bridge 120 feet over the seaway would have cost a fabulous amount of money. But if the bridge had to be opened like Tar Bridge every time a ship passed under, there would be traffic chaos on the road and railway. So they built two vertical lift bridges, one at each end of the lock. While a ship is entering the lock, the traffic is diverted to the bridge at the other end. is the Côte St. Catherine Lock, which raises ships another 36 feet up the river.
Six miles further on are two more bridges, a road bridge and a railway bridge. These weren't too much of a problem, but the Lachine Rapids were. They had to be bypassed. And now the seaway lets our ships out onto Lake St. Louis. A pretty lake, but too shallow. And a 27-foot channel had to be dredged. To build two locks, the canal, and the power station at Pahornwal meant digging more ground than the builders of the Panama Canal. These two locks raised the ships another 80 feet to the level of Lake St. Francis. Forty-five miles further on, at Cornwall, we come to the new International High Level Bridge, one end in Canada, the other in the United States. For the first time, the St. Lawrence Seaway passes through American territory. We Canadians built and paid for 75% of the seaway. It took the Americans 30 years to make up their minds to come in with us, but finally they realized this was good for us both, and we get along fine. And now, at Eisenhower Lock, they take their families out on Sunday afternoons to see the world shipping passing through the United States. Here is the control dam at Iroquois, and the old town is at the bottom of the lake. 100-year-old homesteads have been replaced by a $14 million lock and canal. Above Iroquois, the seaway leads clear into Lake Ontario, the first of the Great Lakes. Toronto is the fastest growing city on the continent and the center of Canada's richest industrial area. But industry needs power. Without a desperate need for hydroelectric power in Ontario and New York, the St. Lawrence Seaway might still be waiting to be built. Niagara Falls provides an enormous source of power, but still not enough. So extra power is obtained further down the river at the International Rapids and at Pohornwall. Alongside Niagara, in utter contrast to the roar of tumbling water, runs the peaceful Welland Canal. Its seven locks raise ships 325 feet, so they may pass from Lake Ontario onto Lake Erie. And now the great industries in the very heart of the continent have direct access to the oceans and markets of the world. Uranium ore, power for the world of the future. Timber for building, for matches, for our daily paper. Europe can regard Montreal and Toronto as the largest ports on Canada's south coast. Chicago, the biggest on the United States' north coast. An eighth sea has been added to the seventh. A sea with a coastline of 8,000 miles. A sea 2,000 miles inside a continent. Hail the Lux and Majo Canadian and U.S. ports on the St. Lawrence Seaway and Great Lakes Waterway. There are seven locks in the St. Lawrence River portion of the seaway. Officially, the seaway extends from Montreal to Lake Erie, including the Welland Canal, and the Great Lakes Waterway includes the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. The seaway is named after the St. Lawrence River, which it follows from Lake Ontario to the Atlantic Ocean. This section of the seaway is not a continuous canal but comprises stretches of a navigable river, many locks, and short channels to bypass difficulties in the natural waterway. The St. Lawrence Seaway Description The St. Lawrence Seaway was preceded by a number of other canals. In 1862, 
Locks on the St. Lawrence allowed transit of vessels 186 feet 57 meters long. 44 and 1 half feet 13.6 meters wide. And 9 feet 2.7 meters deep. The Lachine Canal Because of the virtually impassable Lachine Rapids, just above Montreal, the St. Lawrence River was once continuously navigable, only as far as Montreal. Lachine Rapids gets its name from the French word for China, La Chine. The early European explorers dreamed of finding a route from New France to the Western Sea, and then to China. And hence, auspiciously, the canal was called Lachine. This is a view of the Lachine Rapids. Montréal lies just below the Lachine Rapids, which were the upstream limits of navigation by ocean-going vessels before the completion in 1959 of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Montréal rose to prominence as Canada's principal eastern seaport. Today, Large vessels must still stop at Montréal, while medium-sized ocean-going ships may continue to the Great Lakes. Icebreakers keep the ports of Montréal and Quebec open year-round, but ice prevents navigation on the upper river from December to April. Opened in 1825 The Lachine Canal was the first to allow ships to pass the rapids. The Lachine Canal, Canal de Lachine in French, bypasses the rapids and goes through the southwestern part of the island of Montréal. The opening of the Lachine Canal in 1825 permitted ships to bypass the unnavigable Lachine Rapids. Montréal was then incorporated as a city in 1832. The Lachine Canal runs 9 miles, 14.5 kilometers from the old port of Montreal to Lake St. Louis through the Montreal boroughs of Lachine and Las Al. The Well End Ship Canal opened in 1829, soon after the Erie Canal was opened in 1825. The Well End Ship Canal, joining Lakes Erie and Ontario, bypassed Niagara Falls. The Lachine Canal, 1825, bypassed the rapids. And the Welland Canal, 1829, opened up this route to the west. These we both enlarged over the years. Finally, the St. Lawrence Seaway, opening in 1959, made navigation by large ocean-going ships possible from the Atlantic Ocean to the entire Great Lakes region. The Great Lakes Waterway is a system of channels and canals that makes all of the Great Lakes accessible to ocean-going vessels. Its principal civil engineering components are the Welland Canal, bypassing Niagara Falls between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, and the Sioux Locks, bypassing the rapids of the St. Mary's River between Lake Superior and Lake Huron at Sault Ste. Marie. There are also maintained channels in the St. Clair River and Detroit River between Lake Huron and Lake Erie. The Niagara River, including Niagara Falls, connects Lake Erie to Lake Ontario. The Niagara Falls was always an obstacle to navigation into the upper lakes until the Welland Canal was completed in 1829 and expanded ever since to allow ships to pass around this bottleneck. The St. Lawrence Seaway and Great Lakes Waterway are co-administered by Canada and the U.S. They opened the Great Lakes to ocean-going vessels. However, the move to wider ocean-going container ships that do not fit through the locks on these routes has limited shipping on the lakes. The two waterways are often jointly referred to as the St. Lawrence Seaway. The Great Lakes Seaway has larger locks and deeper drafts than the St. Lawrence Seaway, resulting in several lake freighters being confined to the lakes. 
being small enough to operate on the waterway but too large to pass down the seaway. We will next have a short video clip on the Well End Canal. Between Lakes Ontario and Erie, there is a vast and prodigious cadence of water inasmuch that the universe does not afford its parallel. The waters from this outrageous precipice do foam and boil, making an outrageous noise more terrible than that of thunder. But when the wind blows out of the south, their dismal roaring may be heard more than 15 leagues off. Father Hennepin a Franciscan with the La Salle expedition exploring the continent west of Lake Ontario provided the first written words describing the world's greatest waterfall. Twenty years later, a French engineer, Monsieur Vauban, advocated the canal across the Niagara Peninsula. Niagara Falls is tremendously high, but there is nothing there which cannot be corrected by men. And a canal eight or ten leagues long with the locks will remove the difficulties. But Vauban had never actually set foot in the New World and never set eyes on the falls. It was perhaps for this reason that his concept of a canal between the Great Lakes was not taken seriously. For George Washington, a canal across the Niagara Peninsula, linking Lake Erie and Ontario, would be a blow to the very future of the United States of America. How do we prevent the Western territories from falling into the hands of the Spaniards by way of the Mississippi, or the English by way of the St. Lawrence, he asked, and provided his own answer, an Erie Canal. The Sioux Canal and Locks Also important was the Salt St. Marie or Sioux Canal, built in 1855 that linked Lake Superior and Lake Huron. This latter canal allowed Duluth, Minnesota, and Thunder Bay, Ontario, to be ports. The Sioux Locks and Canal provided an outlet for the grain of the Dakotas and abundant minerals in Minnesota and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The effect on New Orleans was dramatic in 1835. 70% of Western exports of flour, 98% of corn, and 95% of whiskey went through the port of New Orleans. By 1860, the percentages were 22, 19, and 40, respectively. This shows the location of the Sault Ste. Marie and the Sioux Locks connecting Lake Huron to Lake Superior. The Straits of Mackinac connect Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. It also separates the Lower Peninsula of Michigan from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The St. Mary's River and the Sioux Locks connect Lake Huron to Lake Superior. The St. Mary's River and the Sioux Locks are an important shipping lane, connecting Minnesota's iron mines to the steel mills of Gary, Indiana. Interstate Highway I-75 goes over the Mackinac Bridge to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and then to the border of Canada at the St. Mary's River and the Sioux Locks. I-75 is the only coast-to-coast-to-coast -to -coast -to -coast U.S. interstate highway. How is that? Hence we, I-75 goes from the north coast of the U.S. at St. Mary's River south to the west coast of Florida at Tampa and then to the east coast at Miami. The St. Mary's River connects Lake Superior to Lake Huron. We see in more detail that the St. Mary's River connects Lake Superior to Lake Huron. The cities of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan and Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario are on either side of the St. Mary's River. 
Sault Ste. Marie gives its name to both the Canadian and U.S. cities at the site, in Ontario and Michigan, respectively. Where does the word salt come from? And why is it pronounced like Sioux? The word salt comes from an old French term for leap or jump and was used to refer to rapids or waterfalls, such as the falls of the St. Mary's River. The word salt comes from an archaic spelling of sot, from solder. The French word for leap or jump, similar to somersault. The word salt in French is pronounced like the English word sous. The St. Mary's River drains Lake Superior, starting at the end of Whitefish Bay and flows 75 miles, 120 kilometers, into Lake Huron. The St. Mary's River is the international border between Michigan in the United States and Ontario and Canada for its entire length. The Sioux Locks bypass the rapids of the St. Mary's River, where the water falls 7 meters, 21 feet, from Lake Superior. The Sioux Locks The Sioux Locks are a set of parallel ship locks on the St. Mary's River between the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Ontario, Canada. These locks make it possible for large ships to travel between Lake Superior and the Lower Great Lakes. The Sioux Locks were opened in 1855. It enabled ships to move from Lake Superior to Lake Huron, down the 20-foot rapids on the St. Mary's River at Sault Ste. Marie. Without these locks, ships cannot travel in this area. American Indians struggled to travel by canoe on the St. Mary's River long before locks were invented. They would have to paddle their canoes to shore, carry the canoe around the falls, and then launch back into the water. This made it impossible to carry heavy loads and transport large amounts of goods. Today, mass transport of goods and people is possible thanks to the Sioux Locks. An average of 10,000 ships pass through there each year. In fact, it is the busiest set of ship locks in the world. The Sioux Locks enable ships to transit the 21-foot, 7-mute drop between Lake Superior and Lake Huron. The locks pass an average of 10,000 ships per year. The locks are closed for three months during the winter, from January through March. When ice shuts down shipping on the Great Lakes, the winter is used to inspect and maintain the locks. The first of the U.S. Sioux locks was completed in 1855. These are the Sioux locks adjacent to Sioux St. Marie, Michigan. This shows the U.S. Sioux locks and the Sioux St. Marie International Bridge between the United States and Canada. The Sault Ste. Marie International Bridge opened in 1962, permits vehicular traffic to pass over the locks, and is the northern terminus of Interstate 75. This is a view of the Sault Ste. Marie areas of Michigan and Ontario. These are the Sioux locks on the American side. There are four sets of locks. The Sabin Lock was built in 1919. The Poe Lock was completed in 1896 and rebuilt in 1968. The Davis Lock in 1914. And the MacArthur Lock was built in 1943. Here are the four Sioux Locks on the U.S. side. The MacArthur Lock was built in 1943. It is 244 meters, 800 feet, long, 24 meters, 80 feet, wide and 9 meters, 29 feet, deep. This is large enough to handle ocean-going vessels that must first pass through the smaller locks in the Welland Canal. 
The Pollock was rebuilt in 1968 after the St. Lawrence Seaway had opened. It is 366 meters, 1,200 feet long, 34 meters, 110 feet wide and 10 meters, 32 feet deep. The Pollock can take ships carrying 72,000 tons of cargo. The Po is the only lock that can handle the large lakers used on the upper lakes. The U.S. locks form part of a 1.6-mile, 2.6-kilometers, canal called the St. Mary's Falls Canal. This is another view of the St. Mary's Falls Canal. The entire St. Mary's Falls Canal, including the locks, is owned and maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which provides free passage. This shows the Sioux Locks with the twin cities of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan and Ontario, along with the Erie Canal, constructed in 1824 in central New York State. The Sioux Locks were one of the great infrastructure engineering projects of the U.S. The Sioux Locks were designated a National Historic Landmark in 1966. This is an animation showing the operation of the locks. The Sault Ste. Marie Canal The first Canadian Sioux Lock was built in 1798 by the Northwest Trading Company. It was destroyed in 1814 in an attack by the U.S. Major shipping traffic uses the U.S. locks. The current Canadian lock, the only Sioux Lock on the Ontario side, was first built in 1895 and was rebuilt in 1998. It is used for recreational and tour boats. The Sioux Locks are a well-developed tourist site that offers viewing stands to watch the locks at work and tour boat trips through the locks. The Sault Ste. Marie Canal is a National Historic Site of Canada. The canal is part of the shipping route from the Atlantic Ocean to Lake Superior and includes a set of locks to bypass the rapids on the St. Mary's River. There are several heritage buildings on the site, the administration building superintendent's residence Kennelman's shelter powerhouse and stores blacksmith shop, all constructed from red sandstone from the canal's construction. Recommended videos, part 2, Canals in America. Recommended video, New York State Canal System Explainer video. Recommended video, Allegheny Portage Railroad and Canal 1800s. Part 1 of 2. Recommended video. Allegheny Portage Railroad and Canal 1800s, Part 2 of 2. Recommended Video, History of the Sea and Canal. Recommended Video, Chesapeake and Ohio Canal National Historical Park. Recommended Video, The Ohio and Deary Canal. Recommended video, Exploring the Miami and Erie Canal. Recommended video, Illinois and Michigan Canal. Recommended video, Conquering Niagara, The Story of the Welland Canal. 
Recommended video, Explore the Sioux Locks of Sioux St. Marie. Recommended video, How the Sioux Lock System Works. Recommended video, The Story of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Recommended video, The Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Seaway Shipping System. Recommended video, St. Lawrence Seaway and Eisenhower Locks. Messina, New York. Recommended video, YouTube Navigation. Recommended video, YouTube Navigation. For a water level experience of a canal, view a canal boat ride. It's the next best thing to being there. Recommended video, Popular DC Activity Returns to the District. A new way to to see and o canal in Georgetown. Recommended video, Monticello 3 Canal Boat Ride in Coshocton, Ohio. Recommended video, Monticello 3 Canal Boat Rides at Historic Roscoe Village in Coshocton, Ohio. Recommended video, Time Lapse Trip Through the Erie Canal. Recommended video, a day on the Erie Canal. Time lapse. Recommended video. Two days running the Erie Canal, New York in three minutes. 20 seconds time lapse. Table of contents. Canals part two. Canals in America. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.